Um, my name is Cynthia Dines, and I'm 47, and today is April 27th, 2008, and I'm in Sacramento, California, and I am here with my father. And my name is Bob Timberlake. Uh, I'm 74, and this is also April 27th, 2008, in Sacramento, and I'm here with Cynthia, my daughter. Okay. So, Dad. Um, yes, daughter. <laughs> Listen to me. No. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to ask you questions about um, Grandma, Grandma Timberlake, and, and when you were growing up and some of the things she did. Um, you know, she was born in 1900, and so, the you know, it's real interesting to think about the things that she went to growing up. So maybe you could tell me an sto uh, interesting story or something about her that you remember. Well, I... That she remembers, or that she maybe she shared with you, or... Well, I, a lot of stories, naturally. I I was born in 33, so she was already 33 when when I was born, so she was born in, in 1900. She did have her last child at age 45. That was Vivian. <laughs> he was 45, which is unusual today. She had a total of, uh, she had a total of 10 children, uh, two of them, one brother and one sister, one of them died uh, the same day that it was born. The mm. other one was three months old. Oh. It was a boy and a girl. And something you probably didn't know is that I also had a half-brother. Oh, that, nice. Uh, his name was Woodrow. And uh, that was one that hardly anyone talked about because I think my grandmother actually raised him. Oh. And he was in and out of trouble most of his life and everything. And, and actually, he, uh, he died by being shot in the leg by... Uh, the police oh, wow. and the allegation is that they sort of neglected any care and they just sort of let him die. Let him but, die. Yeah, my mom, she naturally, she lived through all of this 10 or 11 children that she had and raised all of them and then uh, the depression hit in 29 mm -hmm. and whatever people had back then, she was in Tennessee and whatever uh, people had at the time pretty much was gone and I remember as a child um, watching and as a child, you don't really get the same perspective, but I remember watching her and what she did. She made money during uh, some of the hard times by uh, actually doing sewing for uh, some of the black people. Mm -hmm. And my oldest sister and, and Lois, my next oldest sister, said that had it not been for the money that she made doing sewing and other things for the black people in Tennessee. Yeah, in the South were, during that yeah. time, yeah. When it, where all the discrimination was, that if it hadn't been for that, that uh, there would have been times where we would have had nothing to eat. Right. And I do remember that uh, she would uh, do whatever she had to, to, uh, to get money to put food on the table. My dad worked, but he, uh, he started working, uh, you know, after the Depression when Roosevelt started all of the, re the recovery programs, mm -hmm. the WPA, he worked... Uh, building uh, roads and things that uh, for a dollar an hour which was quite a bit of money back then uh, he was uh, the job they told me he had was using a jackhammer put eight hours in that wow. they would work and if they, if they had a job at all that was uh, that was something i remember uh with my mom during uh, uh in the late 30s when it was probably right around 39 when i was old enough to walk around with her we would go to at the time they call it the uh uh, commodities, or some people call it a commissary, but oh. really what it was was like a food locker similar to what they have now. Mm -hmm. But you would go down there. Our day was Thursday to go down, and since uh, we lived uh, pretty close to there, we'd take a little wagon. I'd pull the <laughs> wagon and go down with my mom, and I think my brother Gerald was along. But we'd go down on Thursdays and get the commodities, which was uh, flour, eggs, the staples, butter, and things butter. like mm -hmm. butter and things like that, right? And uh, one one little side about it is that my mom knew what time to go down because her her niece worked there, Pauline. <laughs> she had an inn. She had an inn, yeah. <laughs> and so she would uh, she would go down a certain time on Thursday late in the day because if there was things left over, she would get additional things because we had a, had a big family. Oh. Uh, I also remember some stories of my mom is that when you, when you were called by both names, <laughs> yeah, you knew you were in trouble. Right. If it was, if she just That's called. That's true now. <laughs> she, yeah, my name uh, was Bobby. Right. It was, was not Robert, but it was Bobby. Bobby. You Eugene. know, and if she would just say Bobby, that was okay. But if she said Bobby Jean, 
you knew damn well that you were there was some trouble. And, did, and there were times when my brother knew that I was in trouble, and he'd say, "Mama, you want me to go out and get a switch off the peach tree?" <laughs> I was going to ask you, <laughs> did she use switches? Yeah, she would. She'd some. He'd sometimes go out and get a switch, and then she for you. Phew, Which yeah. brother? Gerald. Gerald. Yeah, the one that had a had a little lisp. <laughs> oh, you yeah, there's so many things, you know. Yeah. I, I was there from. Well, born in '33, but I left in in '51. Went into the Air Force, yeah. so there's lots of stuff to. A lot oh, of good yeah. memories of mom, but uh, you know they were poor uh, yeah. because of the depression. They were poor, not because they were stupid or anything, but they were right. poor, and they, unfortunately. But um, she never had a lot, but uh, she was really rich. Yeah, yeah. Well, I remember when she used to shovel coal every winter for to heat her home. Did you guys do that when you were young? Did you have coal? Or? Well, we had coal, but coal cost, uh, she would have it delivered. And I, I can remember when they had the money, when they came into some money, the first thing they would do is call over a coal company. It was Christie Huggins, and it would cost $14 a ton delivered. <laughs> and they would come and dump it in the backyard, right, wherever, they, wherever your place was. And you had coal scuttles, and you'd go out. And in the wintertime, sometimes when we had a snow, you'd have to go out and rake the snow off and get, mm-hmm. to get the coal to bring in to put in the pot belly stove in the, in the front room, which people call the living room. Mm-hmm. But the front room that I remember, we had so many kids, uh, had brothers and sisters, that you didn't have a front room and a back room and a living room and a bedroom. You had rooms. Right. <laughs> and uh, these rooms usually had, if, even if it was a front room, it usually had two beds in there with at least two kids in each bed right. and a fireplace. And uh, but it, I can still remember uh, how comfortable that was, uh, regardless of whether you had money or food or anything, to be in a house that was warm with a nice fireplace like that. Oh and, yeah, you know. Yeah. And, uh, so. Now, when did you did you live at all in the house that Grandma lived in when she died? No. No. So she. No, I, the one that I remember most was on uh, Church Street. Right now, that's a parking lot for the city hall, which is across the street. But back <laughs> okay. then, it was a it was an old house that had vines all the way across the front porch, and uh, it was uh, it's where I had most of my memories from. Oh, I, I would say from early as five years old up until uh, I was about ten. We lived there that long, but that, that sticks in my mind to Church Street, and we were only one block from well, two blocks actually from the square. You remember mm-hmm. where the courthouse is up here. there? Yeah. Yeah. I remember there that on that place on Church Street that uh, there was a if if we had to go to the store, my mom would give me a dime or whatever to go get a loaf of bread, and she'd say go up to the first store. Well, that was you would, the reason they called it the first store is because when you walked up there, it was the first store. <laughs> so it had the name. Everybody called it the, the first, first store. store. <laughs> yeah, go up to the first store. You know, I think it was West Brooks or something. Right. <laughs> yeah. So we'd go up there and, and take a dime or fifteen cents and get a. Quite a bit of quite a bit of food for mm-hmm. a dime, fifteen cents back then. But uh, that's the place I remember. We moved from there um, out to East Main Street, nine hundred five East Main Street, mm-hmm. and we lived in a big house there, out near the high school, about a block from the high school. Uh, but it had four other families. It was a big house that had been converted into like oh, four apartments mm-hmm. and all. And we were there for I think maybe for a year or so. Mm-hmm. And then we moved out to. Uh, they called it the goat farm out of Howells Hill Pike, but when you go out uh, past the college, uh, I don't, you don't you don't remember where that is. No. But anyway, um, maybe next time back there you can go out and find it. But it was uh, <laughs> it was about mm, five ten miles out of town, but it was an old house, an old farmhouse. Is this plenty the one of land. with the um, the red with the stripes on it? No, or? no, that's is that the one you grew up in. That's, or? No, that's the one later on Patterson. Oh, okay. But this one was way out in the well, way out in the country. It was. Uh, out near uh, uh, the center of the state of Tennessee Middle was Middle. about a quarter of a mile from where this house was. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, and then the, the, right there where the center of the state is, uh, there was a, a schoolhouse. Mm-hmm. And that schoolhouse had a pump outside. If you, The kids, if they wanted water, they'd go out, you know, had a manifold going out, and you'd pump the water, and you'd come up, squirt out through the manifold, and you'd get a drink. And my sister Louise and I, we used to have to walk from the house up there about a quarter, of, well, maybe eighth of a mile to this schoolhouse. Well, it was way out in the country, and she used to try to scare me on the way back. We'd take a bucket. We didn't have running water. Mm-hmm. We didn't have inside water. We didn't have inside bathrooms. So we'd walk up there with galvanized buckets and fill up two buckets with water and then carry them back to the house. And that was our drinking water and our water to cook with and our water to wash with and all that stuff. 
And I remember that there was a story that some black man had been hung on one of the trees there, and Louise always pointed that out, <laughs> tried to scare me. Yeah, but it was a. This was out in the country, and it was a good place. And I don't know how long we lived out there, but uh, it had a lot of. That's the one place where Vivian. So it had to be. Vivian was born in '45, so it had to be about '46, '47, mm-hmm. maybe '47, because Vivian's about two years old, and we had a persimmon tree. It was out front, and when persimmons are green, they're very bitter. Oh. And I remember Gerald and I got a persimmon off and, and gave it to our sister. She was two years old just to watch her make the face. Yeah. You guys are cruel. And <laughs> another thing to remember about that one is that there was a white blind horse oh. that the owner of the place had to just run around all the And we found the horse one day where it had walked off a little cliff and killed itself or oh. whatever. Yeah. And but, you found uh, it. Huh? Yeah. Oh. But uh, that was so we lived out there, and then the next place that we moved, that they moved was uh, uh, on Patterson. That's where we had the, you know, the, you remember the house with the... I just remember pictures you remember of being it. I think there. I was a baby. You were a baby. Was that when I ate the chicken poop off the floor? Well, you didn't yep. eat it. No, 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 no. no. no we had, we had well, when we went back there after we got married and, and whatever, we had a couple of kids and you were, when you were born, we went back. Mm-hmm. And you were out, well, we've got the movies of you out walking in the yard with all the chickens plucking around and right, everything, you know. Right. And you came around and you had some chicken <laughs> droppings on you, but you, not in your mouth or anything. Oh, okay, good. But, uh, yeah, no, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> but uh, that was the house that uh, we lived there for quite a while, so that one was right near the railroad. Right, that's what I remember and, you saying. Uh, yeah, right near the railroad. And that's where uh, most afternoons Louise and I would listen to the radio from WLAC in Nashville. Mm-hmm. And at about... 2.30 in the afternoon, this radio station in Nashville was right near the railroad track. And as the train went by, it made so much noise that the announcers in there couldn't, it wasn't a soundproof room that they had. You could hear the train go by, so they made a habit each day. It was called the Pan American, and it's one that went down to New Orleans, down through Nashville, uh-huh. and down through there. So uh, the radio announcer each day would tell you who the uh, engineer and the fireman on the train was, oh, the names. Wow. So yeah. my sister and I, we used to always, because we'd learn these names over and over. Right. And there was about six of them that they would take. So we used to uh, guess who's going to be the fireman and um. engineer that day. Well, it was 30 miles from Nashville, so we knew that it would take the train about 30 minutes once it got up to speed to get from Nashville to, to Murfreesboro. Huh? So we'd go down to the creek. The railroad was only, you know, two houses away. We'd go down to the creek <laughs> and then amazing. wave to them as they went by. Oh, yeah. wow. Could have yelled that, out their names. Yeah, yeah. That was a house that um, that we lived in when I uh, went in the Air Force in 51. Oh, okay. Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. In 51, when I decided to go into the Air Force, I'd been sitting up uptown, me and uh, a guy by the name of Tom Horn. Tom and I were outside the pastime billiards where we used to play <laughs> pool. Cause we How loved old were to play. you? Well, I was 18. Yeah. I've just turned 18. 18 years and 10 days. <laughs> we're sitting outside on the curb. We just finished playing pool in there. And he says, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I don't know. What do you want to do? He said, well, you know, said Jesse, Jesse Burnett, a friend of ours, he said, who joined the Air Force last week? I said, oh, yeah. He said, you want to join the Air Force? I don't know. How do we do that? He said, down in Nashville. Uh, that's 30 miles away. I said, well, I don't care. So we went out, stuck our thumbs out, hitchhiked to Nashville, found a recruiting office down there and got an interview. And next thing we knew, they put us on a bus, took us out to this building where they had dozens and dozens of guys. This was during the Korean Korean War. Took us out there and uh, along with other busloads of guys. And we went into the building and they had us take off all our clothes. <laughs> A whole bunch of naked guys lined up there, and they put a number five with a grease pencil on my chest. I was number five. And that's where they gave you the physical. They ask you what branch of the service, the Army, Air Force, whatever, and I I wanted the Air Force. I was lucky to get it. Right. Yeah, because my brother had been in the Air Force, plus the Marines, plus the Army, and whatever. So I, uh, I we went back after the physical. They took us back to the recruiting office, and we got sworn in. And so we hitchhiked back home. So I go into the house there where mommy, she says, well, where have you been all day? You know how she would say that, yeah. well, Lord, where Lord have you been? Be. Lordy be, where have you been? And I said, well, we went to me and Tom went to Nashville. Well, what'd you do in Nashville? What are you doing way down there, 30 miles away? And I said, oh, not much. We just joined the Air Force. <laughs> she said, you did what? I said, we joined the Air Force. 
no. And I said, yes. She said, well, is that what you wanted to do? And I said, yeah. Well, I guess if that's what you wanted to do, that's what you're going to do. Well, when do you have to leave? And I said, 10 days from now. <laughs> so, well, okay. So when my sister Louise heard about it, she came over, and this was in, in November, and she started trying to put me on a guilt trip. Well, you won't be here for Thanksgiving, and you won't be here for Christmas, and Mom's going to be my ass. So, you know. <laughs> so anyway, that's that was in 51, yeah. 1951. And so 10 days later, I... We went down to the train station and, and got on a got on the train along with a bunch of other there was you know on the trains then we had to go to Lackland Air Force Base in Texas. Mm-hmm. So we got on the train and I'd say it was probably at least fifty percent, if not more, of of men going going for basic training. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that's first time I'd ever been out on my own like that. You know, yeah. Big adventure and so forth and. You had uh, back in the club car, and they had poker games going. I didn't know that much about playing <laughs> poker, but I played and won a little money. Is that when you started smoking? Won twelve dollars. No, I started smoking when I was twelve years old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When I was twelve years old, speaking of that, uh, there was a place where we hung out was a uh, little corner grocery store, Myrtle and Fonzie Black. And uh, Fonzie was a drunk, and Myrtle was <laughs> was always on his case about something. But they owned a grocery store there, Black's Groceries. And they let us kids hang out there. We had like a gang of kids, not right. a bad gang like right. today, but right. a gang of kids in the neighborhood that hung out there. And uh, Our gang. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, so that's where we hung out at Myrtle and Fonzie's. And I remember once in the wintertime, we were sitting around this pot belly stove back behind the meat counter there, and he had a big old chopping block. And I'd watched Fonzie over time take the knife and sharpen it like this, you know. Mm-hmm. And he was out of the room at the time, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll sharpen it for him. <laughs> So you see that little scar right across my finger oh. there? Yeah, I picked it up and went, sliced, oh, it, sliced, sliced that thumb wide open. Yeah, but uh, Probably yeah, never that's, told your mom either, huh? No. I wrapped it up. No, I just wrapped it up. Yeah. yeah. But uh, oh. So anyway, that's we lived on Patterson. Uh, that's not a street anymore. It's, it's just grown over with weeds and yeah. all. There's no houses or anything there now. It's, yeah. You know. But uh, and that's where I went. And then for a while I was in the service, and they moved up to Kings Highway. Oh, okay, that's yeah. when they moved. Yeah. So I was never King's Highway other than just going back to visit. Right, right. I remember being there, being young and walking down to the corner, and there was that little, I don't know if it was a one. Grocery store. Uh, like, yeah, ga- was it a gas station, too? Or, yeah. But mm-hmm. I just remember how it kind of cut off the corner. Right. And then they, you you got your uh, soda pops out, outside. I just remember thinking, you know, coming from California and Sacramento yeah. being so different than the middle of Tennessee in the 60s or whatever, you know, I was really neat to walk up to the corner store and um you know get a drink out of get a pop out and mm-hmm. you know getting i i don't know if you know being a kid i remember the glass bottles of coke there and i don't remember having them here or maybe we just never bought them so i remember thinking that was just oh just you know so different it was like a foreign country yeah, being they were, they were in, in a nickel also right a nickel for a bottle right. they they called them they didn't call it pop in the south they called it uh, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, yeah. Not, not Coca-Cola, <laughs> right, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola or Pepsi. They had some Pepsi, yeah. uh, but it was double cola. Yeah, Where you got a double great cola. big 12 ounces for a nickel. Yeah. And, uh, you know, all the other ones. But the one that my dad used to take you guys up there when we were back, he liked to take grandkids up to the mm-hmm. corner. When uh, the boys, what they got was the in the chocolate, the chocolate milk in chocolate the, milk in the bottle. glass bottle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they had the regular machine where you could... Um, machine you put a nickel in and you could slide it take yeah. it out you know yeah yeah that's a little corner grocery store yeah i remember the milk in the bottle the chocolate yeah. milk in the bottle that yeah. store has become i think the store has been open as a store several times since then one time it became a little hole in the wall church i think i remember that yeah. yeah and then it became a youth center and then it became a store again well right across the corner from that is where i mentioned before about the commodities or uh-huh. whatever uh-huh. that was one place that was also oh okay. later on one of those commissary yeah. commodity places where you get food. Yeah. And yeah. Mom's church was around the corner. Right, I remember I remember not like walking to Grandma's church. But I remember being probably five, when I back there was five in um, Sunday school. And I remember feeling like a celebrity. I think it, we were just so unique coming from California. Yeah. And, you know, and it was just, it was, it was like a whole other country going there. But I remember getting a bag with an apple in it mm-hmm. and maybe a sandwich or something in it and then um the little brown chairs that they had and um you know I, re- I just remember going to Sunday schools and then I remember the next time going and like looking forward to that almost like it was a regular you know routine even though it was probably <laughs> years apart you know um 
but yeah, a lot of I have a lot of good memories of, mm -hmm. of Grandma listening to her stories, and we were talking about how it's funny how she couldn't hear unless she <laughs> really wanted to hear. And I, I remember once being in with Anita and um, Aunt Vivian in the kitchen, and we'd been in the living room, and Grandma was not hearing anything we were saying, and Vivian's going, "Mom, Mom, can you hear us?" and she wasn't replying, and so we went to the kitchen and we were talking, and then um, she, I, don't, I don't remember if she either came in the kitchen or she said it from the living room. She's like, I can hear y'all talking about me. <laughs> you know, it was funny. That, oh, oh, yeah, she she had, couldn't hear. She had selective hearing. She'd sit there and sit in her chair in front of the door, and she'd oh, look outside, yeah. and you'd, you'd, you'd say something about the neighbors across the street and the lady that had the kids over there that right. didn't. And my mom would say, well... <laughs> I don't get into anybody's business. Right. I just mind my own business. I don't care what's going on. I don't, I don't, I don't care what's going on. And then she'd look outside and she said, well, now look at that old woman across the street. She, there, man, she was sitting there by the door. I remember that. Her door was always open. The screen right. door was hooked. Right. But she would look at She knew what was going on in that house. Right. And if that postman came by, and if he tried to put mail out there on the street, if he was a new postman, yeah, he's, can... he's got to bring that mail up and put it in her mailbox on her porch. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, the house she lived in, uh, they were renting it. Right. And I got a call one day from uh, Louise, mm -hmm. and she said that uh, Mom was upset. And I said, well, why is she upset? said, well, Mr. Boyce, the landowner, said he died, and that he said that as long as he lived that she would have a place to stay. She and Dad mm -hmm. you know, could rent the place, but she died, and the family's going to sell the place, and Mom's afraid she's going to have to move again. I said, well, how much does he want for it? And she said, $12,000. said, well, what are we waiting for? You right, know? So, right. so Louise and Harold and, and Lois and Paul and Lula May and Allen and your grandma and I, we all, I think, $3,500 a piece. Right. And so we bought the place, and we offered it to her. Here, this is yours. No, I don't want Irish it. Want I don't want it. No, it's not my place. I'm not. I've been paying rent, and I'm going to keep paying rent. So, okay, pay your rent. So it was, I think, $120 a month she had been paying for this house. Big lot, too. You know, oh, yeah, big, yeah. I love yeah. that house, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, we offered it to her. And, and for all of that time, she would get her checks, her Social right. Security check. Right. And it was funny, when she'd get her check, <laughs> she'd say, i got to go pay my bills. Now, Louise would come over. And mom would go out and get in the car with Louise, and they would drive down to the water department. <laughs> Louise would go in and pay the water bill. They'd go to the electric department. Louise would pay the water, go and pay the, the electric. They'd go someplace else. She'd go and pay this bill, and then she'd go back home. And then mom would get out of the car and come in and sit down. She said, "I'm tired. <laughs> I've I'm been paying so bills all day. I'm tired. I've been paying bills. I just get so tired of that." But she would dress up for that, you know. Right. She'd, she'd sit in her chair there, you know, and get right. her little. Her little thing out, turn on the TV and her little recliner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she, well, you know about the snuff. Yeah, her snuff, yeah. her dip and snuff. And yeah, dip and snuff. She never missed that can either. Her little spit, spit cup. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I remember her telling me about when she got a $5 raise at the church. I think she was about 85 or so or 90, and and she was mad because Social Security reduced her, her benefit by $5. Yep. <laughs> and she was just so angry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I thought she was just like, well, you know, forget the raise then. Wasn't it? Was it Nixon that uh, you when you were back there and oh. she and Dad were, were at the table, just the three of you? And yeah, she was I don't bad know. If it was, it was, it, um, was it Nixon or was it? Uh, might have been Reagan. Might have been Reagan. I, I'm not sure, but yeah, where she and was. She was going on bad mouthing oh, him. Oh yeah. What then, did Dad say? Then Grandpa just said, well, "You voted for him." <laughs> she just shut up, and then she said. Well, you know, yeah. <laughs> I said, well, I, know. <laughs> I mean, Grandpa, who, you know, he didn't say many words ever, but he looked at me and winked and he was smiling. Yep. I just laughed, you know. Oh, yeah. And I, you know, I remember Grandpa just sitting in the chair there and I, we talked about how Zachary, when he sits, he looks so much like Grandpa. Yeah, crosses his, his legs, legs the same way. Yeah. His, just his whole body. He yeah. looks, you know, it's amazing how that, just that little bit of something, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was, um, you know, I like sharing some of that stuff with Greg and, you know, because he, where he grew up, you know, is like in the boonies too. And they are right. pretty poor. And so, you know, some of it he can relate to, even oh, sure. though it's a different time, yeah. you know. I think one of the um, most memorable times, when, when we did live on Church Street, this was during the 40s. I remember when World War II was over. Well, during, we'd never really realized being young when the war started mm -hmm. and then the in 41 and when it ended in 45 because in 
41 when it started. I was only eight years old. I had no idea what was going on any place in the world. You know, right. at that age, you're just yeah. whatever, having fun. But I remember all during the war, we used to uh, collect uh, scrap iron and things for the, you know, take them and sell them and all. And uh, the day that the war ended, I was down the street, right across the street at, uh, called him Sun Pits, or Volney Pits was his name, but I called him Sun, a friend of mine. We were there on the porch, and they had, uh, <clears throat> it was uh, August, I think it was the August 10th, because they dropped the bomb. The last bomb they dropped was August 6, 1945. And there was reports that the Japanese had were going to surrender, and we mm -hmm. were sitting by the radio waiting, and they we were sitting on a swing on the front porch with those people that live there, the Pitts's, and they had their old radio in the window there, and we had it tuned in, and then finally they came on and uh, said the president... President um, Truman was going to speak, and he said that the, that the Japanese have unconditionally surrendered, which meant that World War II was over. And um, we went up, we took off running because you could hear all the horror. All right, the right. So he and I, we well, first we went to the house, and I asked Mom if I could go up to the square around the courthouse. So we went up there. And this, in, in town, you couldn't buy any beer or any whiskey. It was a dry Dry right. County, mm -hmm. right? It was actually a dry, dry city for whiskey. You could go outside the city limits and you could buy beer. But you know, we were, I was only twelve years old. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, we went up there, and by the time we got up there, people were already celebrating, driving around and around and around. <laughs> and I don't know where it came from, but all of this moonshine whiskey <laughs> came out, and they were drinking and having just having a gala, and that went on all night long. Yeah, they were dancing in the streets. The the there were a lot of military there because the army used to have maneuvers. Yeah. They had red and blue forces mm -hmm. that would maneuver against each other. And uh, right down the street from where uh, that house was on King's Highway, that's where they used to camp. Oh, and I can't we, remember saying that. Yeah. yeah, we would go down there, and uh, they all had those big old cartridges for their guns. Mm -hmm. They were blanks. They had gunpowder in them, and they went to fire them. The empty ones, we would get... Take, they would give us the empty ones. Or you'd go down there, and then these uh, GIs would give you, they'd send you to the store because they couldn't leave. They'd send you to the store, and they'd give you a dime <laughs> or something get to go to the store. Yeah, yeah. And if you got a dime, well, that was it only cost 12 cents to get in the movie. Oh, we wow. could go to a movie on Saturday for 12 cents. Yeah, jeez. And one way that uh, me and Gerald, my brother, got money to go to the movie, it's not too honest, but we did it, is that we had <laughs> Beckton Westbrook Grocery Store was on the square. Every Friday, the farmers would come in and they'd bring their animals in to the stockyard to, to sell the next day on Saturday, and they would live someplace, relatives and all. So Saturday morning, they would go to the grocery stores and do their shopping for the whole week, and they needed boxes to put their groceries in. And Westbrooks would give you a penny for a box. If you brought them a cardboard box, they'd give you a penny for it. <laughs> well, we'd take a box in there, a couple of boxes in, you'd get two or three pennies. <laughs> And that they had a stock boy that would take these boxes out back and set them on the porch <laughs> in the alley back there. <laughs> well, you know, we we needed some more money, so we'd go down and climb up the, the steps on the back porch, and we'd get a couple of boxes. <laughs> Bring them around. And we'd take them around and sell them to them again until we got enough money to 12 cents a piece to go to the show. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. So we went to, we had two theaters. We had the Princess, which was the, the big theater. It mm -hmm. was pretty big. Single, well, no, we did have the balcony up there with it, but uh -huh. the blacks had to sit up there. Yeah. The blacks at that time couldn't even go into the same entrance. Wow. They had a different ticket booth on the side. Did you have would... any friends who were black? Oh, yeah. 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 But, you know, this you grew up with it, and you didn't. Right. We, I didn't know, and we didn't know any difference. The blacks didn't really either. That's, it was in our, at the courthouse, the fountains would say white only or whatever. Right. It was sort of ironic that the black men and the white men could not use the same restroom at the courthouse. But the restroom for the ladies was mixed. Was yeah. mixed, yeah. Oh, wow. They could use it. So they got along better. Yeah. But it was it was only when I left there and went into service, went to basic training with the Scott Air Force Base in Illinois and came home on a three day pass that I realized what had been going on. You saw the difference in of difference. discrimination and it just it Probably just, when you came out to California too then. Oh yeah, when it came to California. Big difference. Yeah. 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 And uh, so Anyway, it mm. was uh, during the war that we used to go up in uh, uptown, and uh, we had to, to get money when the maneuvers were there. The GIs were allowed to come up on Saturday, a little time off, 
and my we had shoe shine boxes and they had a shoe shine box and uh, Gerald and I would go up together and Gerald you've heard the story maybe before he had a little lisp he couldn't pronounce Gerald because <laughs> his, his come out, it'd come out jewel <laughs> he was three years younger he was, well he's three years younger than me right you know? so anyway we'd go up there and and uh, he would go up to the soldier and he'd say he couldn't pronounce his s's either so <laughs> instead of saying shoe shine soldier he'd say who hein hoder who hein hoder and he'd say what he'd say who hein hoder and he'd point at his shoes and he'd see the shoe shine box that i had so he'd say oh okay kid you gotta shine so i'd shine his shoes and mm -hmm. gerald would collect the money oh, or something. that's a scam yeah, huh yeah really but uh yeah that's that was funny. that was good but the the end of the war that's something that wherever people were at the time right. and even at 12 years old I still remember that because yeah. it had been going on for so many well it seemed like an eternity for me I was you know eight years when it started and right. 13 when it yeah when that it is ended. an eternity huh? yeah really so it was it was really something I mean um, that's funny to to listen to how you grew up during the uh the war and um in the depression um and compare it with mom who grew up in San Francisco a right. whole different environment but yeah and and they had eight you know i think there was more kids but eight mm -hmm. and i think mom and you were in the same order as far as siblings right and you both have four four boys four girls in each family and um even though i think they may have lived a little bit more comfortably i know they were really poor too i remember mom talking about um you know not having food to eat and grandpa being away and grandma being in the hospital and you know i remember her telling me once about um i guess it was like welfare department or something came out and was going to take the two younger ones and grandma mm -hmm. told them you know come back and you know i'm going to stab you or something i don't know like oh, yeah. you're not taking my kids <laughs> you know yeah well one of the things i wanted to ask you about was i remember when when grandma was dying and i remember something about she really wasn't coherent but didn't didn't she kind of come through come to sit up and and talk a little bit before she were you there when she died did you make it back in time no i got a call to come back that they had given her 24 hours. Oh, okay. So I was able to fly back. And when I got there, I went out to, to the hospital. She had been living for just a couple of months in the care facility across That's the street right. from That's the hospital. Right. Right. And so they brought her over to the hospital and expected her to pass away within 24 hours. Well, when I got back there, she was in and out of consciousness. And uh, after about three days, it was sort of obvious that she wasn't ready to die mm -hmm. and but she wasn't aware either of what was going on there was all of us were in the room together you know Lois and Lula May and me and and Tommy and Vivian were all in the room together and uh, of course my brother Bill he had already died you right. know, he died when I was in the hospital right? during yeah. my heart surgery and Brian, Brian, when Brian, Brian yeah. was born but uh, no anyway when I was there I remember mom was laying there in in bed she was completely out of it and suddenly she opened her eyes and she wasn't looking at us and she says i wished i lived in i wish we lived in a place like this yeah so yeah and then did she, so who you, knows what she was seeing at right. the time but well, then she, she closed her eyes very a strong faith oh, yeah, yeah i mean very yeah. you know well when the nurse came in also another time when the nurse came in and started moving her around <laughs> She she raised up in bed, you know. She was ninety nine years and nine months old. She raised up in bed and she says, "Take your hand off me, you old heifer." <laughs> I'm going to call the police. The police. Yeah. So, so anyway, and I came back. Something. I came back home after I was there for almost almost a week, and I talked to Pastor Brother Hill, you know, mm -hmm. he just father in law, and um, so then that's when Vivian called later and said, you know. She she called me about a half an hour before mom died and oh. said that she died. So, oh. yeah. So she wanted to make a hundred so she could get her name mentioned on TV. I know. With what's his name? What was the uh, the, the I, yeah weather guy? Yeah. Bet you know. But uh, no, she did. She did. She made it ninety nine years short. and nine months. Yeah. yeah. Well, and she. I mean, she lived alone till gosh. Oh. oh yeah, in, she, she well was independent her 90s, till right? less than six months before she died. Yeah. And of course, Vivian yeah, she, and Louise yeah. every day. And Anita, know. yeah, I remember, yeah. I remember her coming over. I think Anita one time, and because Grandma wasn't hadn't been eating the meals on wheels things or the senior meals or whatever, yeah. she was angry about that and didn't want that nasty food. And well, and then it was like flooded the toilet. She was trying to flush it down the toilet. Or she plugged the toilet up with right. food. Yeah, <laughs> and she had all those bottles of milk that they gave her in uh, little cartons of milk in the refrigerator. Yeah. yeah, and she liked to eat those little cheese balls. Oh yeah. <laughs> 
you know, when mom when I was back there for the funeral, you know, out here it's it's funerals are sort of I don't know they don't seem to mean too much as right. far as well the funerals do, but the the procession to the cemetery is different right. here they whatever they do, but back there they still even it's, today as big as Murfreesboro has grown, even today. Uh, Mom's funeral. There were so many people there at the funeral home that you know it was overflow really. Right. And uh, the procession to the cemetery, they had about four motorcycle cops went down the wow. highway toward Nashville there, and and people there still do it. They stop. Right. And if they're working, it, they stop and they wait to go. But it's completely different, you know. Right. And for for my dad also was the same when he died at age eighty one. Right. There were so many flowers. Out at the that they had to have a, a truck oh come out gosh. to the cemetery and bring those flowers that were reusable over to the house and put them in the yard out there. Yeah, we had people stopping by wanting to know if they could buy flowers. They thought it was a nursery. <laughs> nursery. It really was, you know. Right. And here, yeah. like I say, they didn't have. They were poor. Right. Uh, monetarily, all their life, but. Uh, but they, was, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it's amazing. When it really counts, they were right. Poor well, you think about all of us and the kids and. You know how lucky and blessed we've been, and how you know successful in yeah. our lives haven't been like that. I mean, you, you go back yeah. those generations and think we're both both sides of my grandparents have right. been through, and you know I think it's a, amazing. And I've always felt this connection to both my grandmas, and um, part of it is my hair because yeah. they both have wavy hair and long hair, and so it was always hard for me to cut my hair because I remember sitting watching I'm not quite, <laughs> watching <laughs> Grandma okay. Timberlake. Um, I remember sitting or laying in that room. I was just telling Greg about that bed in that room. Oh, yeah. And looking out the door at her in her chair when she'd let her hair down and it would go past the floor and she'd pick it up. And I just remember thinking, oh, my gosh, it was just so long. And then she would do her braids and then she'd whoosh, go right back up. Put it back would in go. The yeah. She told, remember I mentioned earlier that uh, I think it was her 95th birthday when mm -hmm. they, somebody mm -hmm. recorded that. And she said that one time, they asked her about her hair. Oh. Nita, I think it was Anita, said, Grandma, said, uh, do you ever cut your hair? She said, well, when I, she said, I got in trouble with Pap. That's what she called her dad. I got in trouble with Pat. When I was 15 years old, I cut my hair one time. <laughs> and I got in trouble with Pap, and I ain't cut my hair since. No. <laughs> she never cut her hair. No, and her hair did. was so long that she would always, and I remember even when I was just really a kid. Really do. She would take that hair down there and mm -hmm. comb it, you know, and then she'd put it back up there, and she always had that bun yep. back there. Yeah. Always cut her hair like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I, uh, and Grandma Viegas didn't have long hair, but she had the way oh, she hair. Oh, you, yeah. you've got the features of your, both yeah. your grandmas. But That's especially, what Raina says all the time to oh, me. Oh, especially, <laughs> you know, Grandma Villegas. Yeah. 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 yeah, Aunt Rain always says, she goes, you got the nose. You're lucky. You're lucky you yeah, got really. gra Grandma's nose. She goes, I got Grandpa's nose. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's really. a big nose. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that was good. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, when I uh, when I met your grandma, it was in 53. We got married in 55. I met her in 53. We literally, you, I don't know if you remember or not, we bumped into each other. We were at Playland in San yeah, Francisco. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> she there. They used you. to have all this, like a circus and all. No, she didn't slap me that day. We were in oh. Playland, and me and uh, Bob Seward, Robert Seward, the guy, we were both stationed at Travis Air Force Base. We went down on Saturday night to Playland down there, and uh, I was hmm, 19, 20. I think I was about 19 or 20 at the time. And uh, we got the bumper cars. We got in line for bumper cars. Oh. That was the thing to do. And right. So we started bumping around, and there was these two girls that were in <laughs> bumper cars, and I kept bumping into them. And one of them had a real, well, both of them had pretty smiles. But it ended, and they got back in line. I said, well, we get back in line behind them, too. <laughs> so there's one had a beautiful smile. Your mom. I was going to say, it wasn't oh, Juanita. Uh, Juanita. <laughs> She's probably Juanita scared had you. a good smile, too, but your mom had, she had that yeah. beautiful smile. You know, yeah. I still carry I know, in, I've seen that car. Wallet. Yeah, Pastor Pastor tells me, he, your mom is hot. And I'm like, you shut up about my mother. <laughs> right. That's just wrong. I got a picture we took down here. It's probably a week after I met her in yeah. my wallet. Carried all the time in my wallet. But uh, no, that's when I beauty. that's when I met her, and we just uh, what we're gonna have fifty three, fifty three uh, years in June. Yeah, yeah, fit, yeah. But uh, no, yeah. she was that smile is what got it, you know. And yeah. I didn't have growing up, I really didn't have girlfriends. Right. You know, not that I didn't want them or anything. I just growing up, eighteen, you go in the Air Force, right. And you're busy from there from eighteen, you get and stationed then you hear at me Travis. This Mexican woman. <laughs> yeah, well, when I'm you know when you meet somebody that's a winner, I, yeah, boy, change. Keep her. I, I think. Uh, I think after 53 years, it might last. Yeah, it might. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. But 
the one thing I'm really proud of is all the kids and grandkids and great grandkids now, the yeah. two little girls. But Brian yeah. is the he's the apple of my eyes, oh, you know. Yeah. 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 He's a sweetie. Yeah. He's a, he's and he's something else and you know. Yeah, it's amazing to look the at. The saddest day is when when Brad died, but uh, yeah. You know, to come out there that morning when you were out. Oh, just, I know. I know. I think about that sometimes and I just yeah. think that you know, that Yeah, but at least he got uh you know, he got to see his son and so forth. Yeah. You know, and, and, uh, I have one picture of them, and that's the picture when we were bringing Brian home from the hospital. Yeah. And that's the only picture I have of them. Yeah. You know, but, I mean, it was yeah. only three months that, you know, that he well, was. Victoria, she, she remembers her dad because they used to lay on the floor out there. and oh. They had the fan, remember? Yeah. Used to throw yeah, the, throw up socks. He'd teach her how to throw the sock up. Trying to get yeah, he taught her a lot fan. of things that I'm regretting uh, now. Oh, well, yeah. But <laughs> she's a great gal. She really is. She's yeah. got a lot of him in her. Yeah. Anyway, a lot of good memories. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you mm -hmm. for sharing. Yeah.